All right, so you're all adults, and I know that I could say, okay, everyone come back together and you would all be ready. But I wanted to model that for you because in a classroom, we give expectations ahead of time, multiple step directions, so it's good for kids to be, you know, getting used to multiple step directions. You know, put your pencils down, have your eyes on me, have your sheet, you know, on the tape corner of your desk, whatever. But do you see how it gives you a chance to finish up things? Great for, and I use it all the time in the classroom, my coaches use it all the time in the classroom when they're modeling lessons, because it gives kids an opportunity to finish what they're doing or finish talking on what they're saying. And so you had a chance now to fill out the self-evaluation. The um, seven keys that I'm going to be sharing with you are in your handout as well. And the self-assessment that you just did is all based on those seven keys. And so I'm going to be sharing six tools for two of the seven keys. So here are the two that I'm going to be going over today. Because this is an hour session, I can't go over it all. Um, but I'm going to be giving you six tools for common core readiness and instruction. Okay, those are the two keys that we're going to go over. The seven keys to really creating a successful common core writing in your building, classroom management, that's key, and I just modeled that one piece there. Uh, writing across the curriculum, responsibilities of administration, which I'm going to be tying into that, teacher training, and homeschool connection. And so these um, keys, three through seven, I'm going to be doing additional uh, sessions and webinars um, for. And so on our website, uh, we'll be adding, we have, this session is kind of in webinar version on our website free to you. All you have to do is go to our website and click, and it'll, there will be a sticky note that says, principals click here for the <coughs> webinar. You can pass it on, you can share it to your teachers, you can share it to your colleagues. Um, but as more, I develop more webinars on the rest of the keys, I'll send you an email and just kind of let you know, hey, it's up on our website, check it out. All right, and so there's icons um, from the slide that are also in your handout. And the objective <coughs> of this session is three parts. The first objective is to go over the two keys that I mentioned, the common core readiness and the instruction. And then the three problems that are obstacles that teachers face and we're going to talk about how to remove these obstacles. And the three problems are knowledge, time, and materials. And so we're going to talk about why teachers aren't teaching, writing the amount they should, and <coughs> what's causing that, so that you can address the problems. Where, and definitely where there's a breakdown. The last objective are, of the session is to give you six tools uh, to solve their struggles. And these tools are in the handout that I had you fix. And uh, those are the icons that you'll see on the slides. And so when we, you see them on the slides, I would definitely take notes on your note page. Any questions on that? All right, let's jump right in. So let's go right to Common Core Readiness with this slide. Do your teachers have, one of the questions that you answered, one of the first questions is, do your teachers have copies of the Common Core Writing Standards, right? That's the basic first one. Um, do your teachers have copies? No? Okay. Well, some of you, yes. Well, let me show you a cool app that I think might even work better for some teachers instead of paper. So this would be paperless. It would be um, portable and simple to use. And so if your teachers have iPads or iPhones um, or you know Mac, they can download this from the iTunes App Store. And here's the address there. And I believe you have this in one of your handouts. No? Okay, so you're going to want to write it down. I shortened the web address using a um, website called Bitly, which is kind of neat. Um, and you can see it's http colon forward slash bit dot ly slash iwzsds. So just copy that down if you want to share that with them. The same app, these are all the math and ELA um, common cores are on this app. So you can download it right to your iPad and have all the common cores that you're doing. You so not have to you know, carry around a binder to a meeting. Then if you are a Droid user for Droid phones, you go on the Google Play Store, and there's a shortened website, or just go to Google Play Store, and it's the same app, but it's just for a different uh, format. Does that make sense, everyone? All right. So do you want me to read the Google Play app address for you? 
No, you don't need it? Okay, you can read that. I don't know if it's case sensitive. I'm thinking it probably might be because it's kind of upper and lower case there, so I would write it that way. But you can just, like I said, go into iTunes and find it by just by um, typing it in. All right, can I move on? Okay. All right, so you're a park state, right? Okay, and you're not a smarter balance state. But regardless, I believe strongly that if we give kids solid writing skills, and we're teaching 100% Common Core for writing, then regardless of the testing instrument, students will do well. Okay, it's a no-brainer. You're teaching it, and you're teaching Common Core, that they will do well. And so, you know, I haven't understood the logic of when we go to districts or we do meetings, and we say, you know, are you doing Common Core writing? And these districts or schools are saying to us, no, we're going to wait until after the test. I'm like, okay, that's crazy talk. Because aren't we supposed to be teaching writing to help <coughs> students have this lifelong skill of writing, not just for the test? Why wait until the test just to see what's on the test so you can teach the test? No, that's not the way we should be doing it. So we have to start teaching Common Core now. And so. Uh, here's some prototype questions. Have any of you seen the prototype questions? This one is from Park, and I'm not going to read it to you, but basically it's saying, here's two informational texts that you read. Um, how is space and earth similar and different with the, pop with the issue of pollution? And then here's how their essay will be scored. You have these two in your handout packets. You have the Park, and then you have the Smarter Balance. Um, and this is a smarter balance example. Which paragraphs include the author's opinion? So students are going to need to not only write in the different text types, but they're also going to be answering questions on the different text types. You know, students won't be able to do well without a lot of practice um, because they're going to need to accumulate these skills over a period of years. You know, I personally, I know this sounds a little weird, but I personally hope that the test will bring back the importance of writing. You know, without a writing test, sometimes we think that there's not the importance of teaching writing. And so, as weird as that sounds, and kind of backwards as that sounds, you know, my hope is that we'll bring back the importance of it. So, there's three text types for K-5 course. Did you know that? Three main text types. Okay, want to shout them out? What are they? Come on, don't be shy. Information. Informational. <coughs> and, it's, and it's called informative or explanatory. So I, I sometimes slip and say informational, but we do need to call it by the word they're calling it because on the test, they use informa informative, and we've been using informational. Kids won't know necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. What else? Persuasive. Okay. Now, opinion. That's my next point. We have to use the, the language in K-5, it is opinion only. So make sure your teachers are using consistent language. That is actually the real power of a program or a system, a framework, tools, whatever you want to call it, that gives teachers consistency so that the same words are used year after year, it spirals. So we, we do need to call it opinion writing, not <coughs> persuasive, not argument, in K-5. Okay? Because that consistency, they have different meanings. Persuasive is different than opinion writing. And then the last one is narrative. So it's narrative, informative, explanatory, and opinion pieces. So um, what's, this is definitely new for teachers and students. Students will be you know, answering questions on various text types. They'll be writing in various text types. Writing opinion starts in K-5, and that's true for informational, the informative, and the research. See, I almost did it again. Um, now, there was a publisher's criteria that came out. Does anyone know about this? Okay. Publisher's criteria came out and said this, that in the classroom, 30% of writing should be opinion, 35 should be informative, and uh, 35 should be 35% should be narrative. Now, we revised right steps to meet those percentages, but many programs have it, so be careful. All right, moving on. Any questions on that? 
All right, so you can take a look at that quote there. Um, in terms of writing across curriculum, students need that practice of opinion and informative writing. So how I see it going, and this is true, I, um, we've read as a team, we read, um, my curriculum people on the, uh, the team, we read uh, the Lucy Calkins book, Pathways to Common Course. Okay, some of you are shaking your heads, you've read that. Definitely the clear message is what I agree with, which is that we need to be teaching um, the structures of the text types during writing time, the structures of what opinion writing is, the structures of informative, the structures of research. We need to have them practice at least one piece during writing time, at least one piece. But then the writing needs to be done in the other content areas because opinion writing is best in science and social studies, right? Uh, in research writing is best with science and social studies. And so it's what I call the learn to write, write to learn, meaning learn to write during writing time and then write to learn in other subject areas. Okay. Any questions on that? All right, so, you know, the, we're getting into the second key now, instruction. Okay. And this is where we're going to start talking about these problems. Okay. And as the principal of the building, the lead learner, leader, it's your job to know the teacher's obstacles and how to remove the obstacles. Because I definitely believe that principal is not a creator of obstacles, they're a remover of obstacles. Because teachers can get to the heart of their job, which is to teach. And so if you don't know what the obstacles are, how can you remove them? So let's, let's go over them. The first problem is knowledge, or really, I should say, lack of knowledge, right? You can see that it's, here's, it talks about a course. I don't think that teachers should just have a course in college or university. I didn't have any. That's why I struggled with teaching writing. Many student, many teachers that come out don't have any, but just one course still isn't good enough. It'd be a good start. It'd be more than what most people have. We need to have more. Well, the you know the lack of confidence or they don't feel like writers themselves is one of the big problems. They don't have the knowledge. But we're not going to focus on the past because there's nothing you could do as a principal to help that write their past, but what you can do is find out why, where their knowledge gaps are. And so, this may not be, this may be a surprise to you, but even people outside the education field are saying, yes, I believe that teachers need to have good, solid training in the area of writing. Uh, we're definitely going to lose our writing language for generations to come if we don't start really teaching writing and making it stick. And so I'll give you a moment to let this next cartoon absorb here. So read the top, look at the expressions, and read the bottom. <laughs> kind of a little bit of um, truth to that, isn't there? I mean, I'm a big texter. I use it all the time with my team members. but. I don't transfer text speak into my writing into emails. Um, it's just, you know, we, we can't allow that to creep in into our classrooms because if we do, it's a slippery slope, right? Uh, I wrote a blog for our site on how the text speak, the concern is it's going to reduce students' grammar. That's a whole other topic for a whole other time. I'm going to move on. But if you're interested, it is on our site and I would definitely check it out. But we have to have the, our teachers teaching writing lessons that are meaningful that will stick. Uh, all right, so you're not writing curriculum experts as principals. You're generalists, right? You have to know a lot about a lot of things, about everything. And so I'm not going to give you, with the rest of my time, I'm not going to give you specifics of writing. I, mean, I would save that for teachers. But who are our best knowledge givers? Everyone, who's our best knowledge givers on how to teach writing? Teachers, right? The ones that are in the field, in the trenches. Um, we created Teacher Star. Teacher Star is where we film teachers, um, and that's how teachers learn best. How you can create Teacher Stars in your building is with this next slide and the next tool that you have in your handout. Do you, everyone see that in your handout? It's called Questions Teachers Have About Teaching Writing. This is 
really powerful. I did this in a district-wide uh, PD several years ago, and everyone raved about um, how helpful it was, because teachers love learning from each other. What we did, there's a couple ways to do this. You'll see at the top, if you read the directions, basically what they do is these are all problems that I've collected from teachers saying that they have with writing, and they're, they're organized. There's about seven pages here. What I would do is I would give this out at a staff meeting and I would go over the directions with them and then have them do it on their own. And you can see that they find glows, what we, and we use these same words when we um, talk about student writing, they find glows, things that are, they're good at, right? And then they find growth, things that they need to work on. And so they find about five, whatever, you know, you don't have to do five, but they find five and they mark them as low or grow, with a plus or a minus sign. Now this is how I would suggest doing it. So pass out the packet, go over directions. Okay, went over that. The second thing is recruit someone to compile the glows and growths. It could be a secretary, it could be a teacher volunteer. What they do is they take everyone's papers and they determine who has what glows, who has what grows, and then they match them up. So if I have a glow in one area, I'm, if I have a glow, I'm going to be the presenter for the people that need that as a grow. Does that make sense? If I have a plus in an area, I'm going to present to people who have a minus in an area. And so what I did for the PD day, and then we do glow sharing. You can do this during a staff meeting, the last 10 minutes of a staff meeting, you can break them up, or you can have those GLOW teachers present to everyone, even if those people don't have GROWs, they'll still get some benefit. What I did at the PD day is something like this. Okay, GLOW teacher David is sharing to a group of GLOWs <coughs> in a classroom. That's what's really great. During a PD day, you use the, utilize the classrooms, so people get to look at to see what's on the walls. He shares for about uh, 10 minutes or so, and then he goes into a classroom that he's now the GROW teacher and he's learning from a GLOW teacher. All right, so there's some logistics to work, be worked out with that, but it is really amazing when you get people, if you have a schedule, it's very organized, it works extremely well, and people feel like now they can be teacher stars. Huge confidence builder. You can also do it with lunch and learns. And lunch and learns are times where teachers are sharing during their lunch time. So there's different ways to do it. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Okay. So that's a tool um, under the glows and grows that's on your tool sheet. <coughs> that's one way to use that problem teacher space. Plus, you know, set, teachers being able to self-reflect, they've said that's one of the number one qualities that really high-performing teachers have is the ability to self-reflect. All right, so now let's go over this next issue with time. If you ask your teachers what's the, um, what makes writing the hardest subject to teach, what would they say? What might they say? Just shout it out. I don't know when to work it in. I don't know when to work it in. What else? What's that? They just don't have time. They don't have time. Okay. So that definitely, when asked, uh, teach, when asking teachers what's the number one, a lot of them say just what you said. I don't have time to teach writing, right? Okay. The thing is, um, well, first of all, if you are, if you have your teachers teaching writing consistently, congratulations, you're in a slim minority, okay? That's generally not what's happening in buildings from what we've seen. It's definitely squeezed out of the busy, of a busy day. You can see National Writing Project, 15% of the school day is spent in writing activities of any kind. Two thirds was word to word for copying the word books, workbooks. So it wasn't even really considered real writing. So I, my principal, I told you I had this amazing principal, Sue Burnham. Her mantra every day was, I do what's best for our children, period. We have to make sure that that's our bottom line. We can't accept the excuse that I don't have time. But I'm going to go over the next slide of why teachers end up saying that. Uh, so this is really key, too. You know, if you, it's totally human nature, right? But this is our children's future, and there's no room for negotiation or justification. Definitely the elementary teacher has a lot of subjects to teach with a lot of obstacles and a lot of challenges, for sure. 
But saying they don't have enough time is an excuse we cannot accept because there's many teachers who are teaching writing and teaching other subjects and doing it. So I'm going to give you some real solutions you can use with your teachers who are saying that they don't have, that it's an issue of time. You know, this is an example of the gym membership that never gets used, right? <laughs> you know, if, if it's something you don't value, we're not going to use it. Or taking a trip to Japan but not wanting to spend all the time on the plane. I mean, if, you, if it's important, you'll find a way. You'll find a way to put it in. And so the teacher's insecurities are what make it not important. So we're going to um, talk about that. But if an engineer at Ford, for example, said, I don't have time to create the safest car, what would happen? Right? <laughs> He'd get the Donald. <laughs> And so we just make sure we just have to make sure that we can't accept that I don't have enough time, but we need to support them and help them. And so I don't have time often means I don't know how. Okay. And so we teach to our strengths what we're strongest at. If I'm good at math, I'm going to teach math, and, and but we have to be a generalist in elementary. And so. Uh, there's three reasons. What do you think they are? Turn to the person next to you and tell them a reason of why you think teachers um, don't know how. What, what, is it, what do they struggle with? 